to now introduce our first artist who will be presenting, Liam Cavanaugh Burdett. Liam is a documentary photographer living in Edmonton, Alberta, by examining the intersection between Canada's economic and environmental impacts on the land and its people. His work highlights many of the real world implications of the theories and concepts he studied at York University in the International Studies Program. Um, Liam then studied photojournalism at Loyalist College and worked briefly for local papers such as the Wellington Times and the Lac La Biche Post before deciding to focus on both freelance and long-term self-directed projects to bring attention to issues ignored or overlooked. And with that, we're really excited to have you with us tonight, Liam, uh, to learn more about your series, Arctic Sea Lift. And so with that, I'm gonna pass on screen sharing to you in just a moment here. Uh, Okay, there we go. You should be able to screen share now. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. So I will, I'm now the host. I will um, share some, some images. This is a slightly larger, slightly different selection of photos than what was shown during Trex than, the, than what is being shown currently. Um, it is still an ongoing project in many ways, but mostly in that the photos which I took on this trip are finally getting down to the point where I will be hopefully putting, putting them together into some sort of publication um, later this year. So with that said, Oh, I think Liam, you are muted. I am. All right, so this is a selection of, of images which came from a project that I shot while on a ship which heads from Montreal up to the high Arctic every year, uh, delivering essentially all the goods that a community might need to live in sort of today's today's world from vehicles to kettle soup <laughs> to insulation drywall uh fuel everything the ships loaded up in montreal they then make the voyage north uh delivering the cargo to communities along the way, which would otherwise be um, rather isolated. Oh. Sorry, actually, there's some way to be admitted. Can you guys see that or is that me? All right. Um, sorry, so yeah, so the ships head north from Montreal every year, uh, delivering the cargo um, across the Arctic sometimes picking up things as well, but mostly just dropping off um, whatever shipments they've been asked to carry. The purpose of this trip was to try to wrap my head around what's going on, what it means to the communities that are sort of reliant on these shipments and also just what will happen as things continue to change and how these are both reliant on and also impacted by sort of the global supply and global trade. What was really interesting to me was how these communities are impacted and what it means not only for 
the people who live in these communities, but also how having this, having these shipments and having this, this trade allows for more development in the North while at the same and trying to trying to understand what that what that would mean um, as an impact on, on the culture on the people who live there. And the way I see this is just a single chapter in what will hopefully be a two or three part series of, of, of projects. One where I'm examining and looking at the shipments themselves and the people who do the work um, to hopefully going up and spending more time in just one or two or three communities um, on a longer term basis and not just in and out for five hours or eight hours, which is really all that I was able to have while, um, while on this trip. Stop it there. Oh. All right, there we go. I think I've turned off the share sharing. Great. Thank you, Liam. Um, and our next presenter, uh, Nahani. I'm just going to introduce Nahani. Uh, Liam, did you pass the hosting ability uh, uh, to Nahani? That'd be great if you can do that while I'm just introducing. Um, Nahani is a Métis artist and photographer based in Banff, Canada. Born and raised in the Rockies, her creative practice has focused on national parks in Canada and the human impact on surrounding natural environments. Growing up in Banff National Park, Nahani understands the relationship between tourism and wildlife, and her work expresses the need to learn to coexist in order to prevent further harm to animals. Nahani's a pho photography graduate from Emily Carr University, and, um, and which is in Vancouver, BC, and she completed her photography practicum at the Banff Center is currently uh, working full time as an artist, creating artwork for galleries and publications internationally, including the 2022 European Cultural Center alongside the Venice Biennale. So lots of exciting things. Thank you, Nahani, for being here. Are you ready to share more about your Loop 14 series with us? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. And then um, can you also see my screen? You bet. Okay. So it says Nahani on it. Yep. With my photo. You bet. Okay. <laughs> You're all set. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hey everyone. My name is Nahani. Um, Ashley kind of gave me that sweet introduction and then this is my, um, uh, presentation. I'm not a graphic designer, so please like, just bear with me. Um, so I write an artist statement every six months because my stuff changes so frequently now, just I think with our ever changing world. So I see myself as like a wildlife photographer, but the animals have to be dead. I know that sounds like morbid, but I rather take photos of animals when they're like resting soulfully than like bothering them in their everyday. And like when they're eating and trying to live and be animals, um, so this is my series loop 14 and I created this while I was a park, uh, yeah, <laughs> park attendant, park campground attendant at two Jack Lake and Banff here where I grew up. Um, so it was just like this silly little campground that I don't know, kind of was, sorry, I forgot to start my timer. Okay, good. Um, that just kind of like, I don't know. I had the weirdest job. I was an equipped camping host, which means you taught people how to camp. 
But the funny thing about it is that they didn't ask you if you knew how to camp. Um, so I was just like, yeah, sure. Like my whole like purpose again, this job is that I'm a local, but no one really knows what that means. So, um, this one, I'll tell you the side story. It'll take up my 10 minutes. So this one time we had to teach people how to make a fire and I couldn't figure it out. Like I just couldn't make the fire. And I actually was just like, so the fire doesn't start today. And like, it was just ridiculous. Um, but that's how dumb my job was. And after saying this, I'm never getting hired there again, which is fine. Um, but during that time I was, uh, we had this wolf, um, enter the campground and it was supposed to be, um, and it got food habituated because people don't know how to like be in a national park. And so people litter and yeah, so whatever the wolf can find, it goes for survival and it ate a bunch of garbage on the campground around the campground. And then that led to the wolf being destroyed because it wasn't scared of people anymore. We had to evacuate the campground, which I thought was going to be for the wolf to run around, chill, like hang out. And then if it didn't find food, it'd go somewhere else. But it was actually for Parks Canada to shoot the wolf and it didn't have a clear shot. So they shot the wolf in loop 14 of the campground and it took seven days to die. So it was in this immense pain for seven days and they found it later below the campground in Bankhead. And yeah, so that kind of resonated. I had like a little bit of PTSD from it and it kind of resonated, resonated with me of how we as Parks Canada officials treat wildlife. And it kind of made me realize that we're not here for the wildlife. We're not here for protection of land. We're here for the tourism. And that's kind of what my hometown here is based on. So I made this work called Loop 14. I found a wolf pelt here um, at the trading post, which is really great for artists. Like if you need a wolf pelt or any fur or any skulls or anything, they, they'll they happily just lend you some stuff. Um, maybe it was just me, so maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but And yeah, so I took this wolf pelt, I smudged it, um, did a little ceremony with a bunch of close friends who are helping me do this project. And I took photos of it where the wolf was shot in loop 14 of two Jack, which led to this photograph. This is, so this is two Jack main, this is two Jack Lake, which is just on the edge of the campground. I took the wolf out there in the middle of winter, obviously, and laid it on the ground and yeah, I took photos of it in this um, photo actually did very well for my career. And I do want to thank Trex and exposure for like, letting me tell my story. Um, as you can tell, I'm not great at talking. So <laughs> my art really <laughs> speaks for itself as well. Um, yeah. So this was with positive slide film and it's, um, uh, obviously some sun specs in there. And I just like, I don't know. I really care about the aesthetics Sorry, of my photography. Nahani, just, yeah. Um, your screen isn't sharing your images uh, if you're flipping. Now. Oh, I am. I've been. Okay. <laughs> oh, shoot. OK. Uh, so sorry. I thought that. Um, yeah, it's just staying on your initial screens. So maybe just. Oh, it. this is so embarrassing. No, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing great. Okay, Thanks, so everyone. Sorry. I appreciate you. <laughs> So yeah, so this is the wolf photo. This is what I smudged. This is what I had a pelt on. And yeah. And now it's slow. Yeah, so this is um, my photograph of Two Jack Lake. And I explained it. So here it is. Um, I hate Zoom. I don't know about anyone else. But <laughs> And yeah, and then it did, um, it did very well. <laughs> so it just traveled around. It went to Toronto for next art Toronto. Um, obviously exposure winner, um, Trex award winner. And it was also an honorable mention in the wild skies gallery of landscape awards. It's still making rounds and I'm still, um, using it for different shows. So it's really great to, uh, have this and just to let you know I didn't know this but when you win awards like you don't get like a certificate so I made these all myself <laughs> um and it's just going 
Oh yes. Okay. And I just kind of want to talk about my future work for the last couple of minutes. Um, so I recently did a artist residency at the Banff center for arts and creativity called ecological engagement through the seasons. And yeah, so this is my studio. Um, as you can see, I have my friend, this little bear and I, and I used, so I harvested some um, mud from the paint pots in Kootenai National Park, um, which you can do if you're Indigenous because it's on your land. And I wrote this quote by Chief Jon Snow on my studio wall. It's called the pipe stones that we got from the mountains and the natural earth paints that we used in our religious ceremonies. And for other special occasions, we're bulldozed over and concrete covers them now. Um, so this book really resonated with me. It's called these mountains are sacred places. And I, if you ever visited Banff or if you ever visit a national park, even like Tofino or stuff like that, like it's a really good book. And just like being mindful of what, like how colonial it is, uh, to have a national park and parks Canada and to say that you can't do, um, your traditional ceremony on this land is ridiculous. Um, and this is my work called decolonize the mountains and I'm be I'm using my colonial practice of photography and I'm beating over it. And, um, because a lot of mountains are misnamed in, um, Canada and I want to use Mount Rundle, the one in the middle with the yellow beading as an example, he was a minister who started, um, the Indian residential school system. And it's the most prominent mountain probably in the world. And it's, named incorrectly it's actually called soaring eagle or soaring eagle taking flight yeah um so as a metis person i'm always constantly at art galleries or whenever someone asks me if i'm native like i have to explain myself because i am white presenting so i took my grandfather's birth certificate and photoshopped it over one of my photos so this was just like an experiment and it's coming up somewhere and this was the end result so this is my grandfather's birth certificate and it just has half breed written all over it and this is a new work that i'm working on as well um and then yeah this is the rest of my studio and that can also tie into my new work which is hole eight so hole eight is kind of um the sister of loop 14 hole eight is a golf course that I golf on here, which is the Banff Springs golf course. So what happens is that every time there's an elk, so the golf course here is a wildlife corridor. And every time there's a wild animal on it, they, um, the golfing people, the owners of the Fairmont, um, call parks and remove the animals. So this is kind of a sculptural work I worked on where I took it on medium format film, um, put it, printed it on plexiglass, built a light box around it. And this is actually going to my exhibition coming up in April in Venice. Yeah. Support me for that. Cause I'm stressed, but yeah. So this is like my art practice. And I thought this really like went well with loop 14. Um, so I wanted to share it with you because I haven't shared it with anyone yet, except for the people who went to my studio. So like maybe three people. Yeah. And then this is where you can find me. So if you have any questions or want to follow me, support me buy my art, <laughs> um, you can catch me here. And then I have two, I'm in two exposure exhibitions right now. One at arts place in Camor, Alberta with Cecilia Letty and the little cabin gallery, which is literally my grandparents shed. So it's very cute. All right. Well, thanks everyone. And stop share. <laughs> Thank you, Nahani. That was great. Sorry, I didn't catch that your screen uh, wasn't sharing <laughs> earlier, but I think we got, we were so in engaged in your story about, uh, <laughs> about teaching how to make fire. So that was great. Thank you for that. Um, and so next, our, uh, our next presenter, I'm just going to introduce, um, we have Joel Matthew Workington with us. Joel Matthew Workington is a Canadian artist who was raised in his father's workshop with the smell of sawdust in his nostrils. He returned to the workshop and found his inspiration as an artist. 
And Workington graduated with honors from the Alberta University of the Arts, formerly the Alberta College of Art and Design, and recently obtained his graduate degree in fine art from the University of Calgary. Uh, Joel Matthew Workington's practice investigates intrinsic senses within the human experience and the conceptual understanding of spirituality. Joel received a Queen Elizabeth II scholarship to continue his research into religious symbols, including the halo. This research was presented at the University's Art Association of Canada conference in 2018. And since then, he has continued researching other symbols and their importance relevant to understanding a universal spiritual experience. So thank you for being here, Joel. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Um, Nahani, did you switch hosting over to Joel? Great. Uh, so you should be good to go. Joel, thank you for being here. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I mean, when you say a lot of nice things like that in a row, it's really quite nice. <laughs> um, so bear with me, we'll get everything sorted. Okay. I'm assuming everyone can see a black screen right now? Yeah. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, my name is Joel Matthew Workington. Thanks for kind of taking your time. Uh, out of your schedules to join us for this talk. Uh, I am an artist. I live and work in Calgary, Mokinstis, Alberta, on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Um, I'm an emerging artist, uh, sculptor, photographer, performance artist, and my work primarily focuses on the connection of spirit and movement and space and how they interact with the spiritual experience. Um, I'm here to talk about my series of work, The Nameless Boy Who Gave His Name to Sunday, um, I want to start by thanking Trex for the opportunity to exhibit with them and the chance to, to share work across Southern Alberta or Southwestern Alberta. It's an honor to be included. Um, there's some really amazing artists there and it, uh, it's, just, it's just really nice to be a part of that community and a part of that thing. I'm hoping everyone can see a photograph of mine right now. No, I'll just keep going. It's fine. Um, I also want to spend a, a quick moment to thank the Exposure Festival. Um, this photography festival provides myself and a lot of our artists the opportunity to experiment and try new things. And as a result of my own experience, I've been able to find some really interesting connections that didn't necessarily exist before. And I look forward to where all those things and those connections can take and what new things can come out of it. Um, we can become stagnant really easily if you don't constantly move forward. And I think it's important to acknowledge when that, when that happens. Um, I create artwork which focuses on intrinsic spirituality and what it means to be a spiritual being. Uh, I spend a lot of my time investigating how spirituality relates to the human experience and on a personal note, how it creates deeper connections, deeper and more meaningful connections to those around me, the world, nature, experiences, etc. Within my practice, I'm really drawn to the in-betweenness of things, as I call it. Um, I kind of try and identify two opposing forces and investigate what commonalities or things exist between them. Um, and I, yeah, the, the nameless boy who gave his name to Sunday, what you're seeing here, is a collection of photographs and sculptures which focus on a single subject kind of admits to blanket of neutral color. And the sculptures interact with what I call the feeling space or spiritual space through their materiality, their form structure, or how they're meant to be worn or used by the subject or whomever is uh, using them. Um, the photographs exhibit how these tools kind of, so to speak, uh, interact with that feeling space, that in-between space that I, that I reference. And I and my work are constantly uh, working towards finding out more about the non-physicality of what it, what it means to be a human being, the emotional, instinctual, visceral, impractical journey that we participate in as sentient beings. Uh, the nameless boy who gave his name to Sunday began as a task to combine everything I've ever utilized into a succinct view of my language as an artist. I began my career learning my voice um, 
through photography, although I was really drawn and fell in love with the three-dimensional thinking required of a sculptural practice, which then naturally developed into a performance art um, practice as well to incorporate my body in order to discuss more complex narratives um, that were part of that same realm. This series of photographs is the culmination of all of these art elements into a single form. Um, and I did this with the goal of trying to create another, a new language, um, something a bit more narrative uh, and kind of more of a collection where each photograph is more of a chapter in a book, um, expressing how I learn about my own and other spirituality. It's a very practical exploration in words to my own history, my past experiences, knowledge, et cetera. Uh, the work presented in the nameless boy who gave his name to Sunday, which consists evenly of performance, object creation, and photography, um, is all in that feeling space, which is why all of the photographs have this manipulation to them. So there's this surreal element where they're physical and real, but can't, can't necessarily exist in a physical place. Um, and it it's meant to, to interact with that in-between space, which is a place I think is kind of this unconscious inquiry of things. Uh, it's a really personal journey um, if from the physicality of something into the emotional, into the emotional connection or the gut or flesh or meat of something. The sculptures are activated when they're worn or used by the subject or performer and access it and accessing that less physical um, place and more emotional output. The objects kind of come from an inspiration of religious objects or architecture, garments, etc. And the familiarity of the form or the patterns that emerge from it kind of creates this context for that work to sit in, kind of parallel to a religious iconography kind of moment, so to speak. Uh, so by pulling by pulling inspiration and by pulling patterns and forms from these places, it kind of creates that context for my work to sit within um, and kind of discuss it with new perspectives. At least that's what I try to do. Um, I am I was I am queer, and I was raised in a more conservative religious household, and I spent much of my childhood active in the religious community, and I was within my own body and soul, this dichotomous relationship. I would often question how confident we could be about our, our righteousness when we would learn how incorrect others could be, especially since I learned that I was made perfectly, but imperfect because of all of my own, my ownness because of me. And so these potent lines be kind of, kind of, began to draw themselves around me and through me. And so I started to question all of these roads and these paths and these blocks and these, and these blocks and walls. Um, and so a lot of my art and particularly this series was created with the goal of creating space to discuss spirituality among diverse religious practices and spiritual beliefs, et cetera, which, yeah, um, it's, it likes it analyzes and contrasts and presents these conclusions in the form of wearable sculptures and surreal photographs, etc. The series contemplates what it is to be spiritual, as I said, both individually and as a community, and the quasi-narrative structure of the photographs connect to that feeling space um, by weaving connections through materiality, connecting symbolisms, both historical, fictional, etc., and creating deeper connections that can kind of exist in between them. It seems in this world that with each passing day, week, month, year, et cetera, we as a global people are becoming more and more divisive. Uh, there's lots of words, statements treated as facts, opinions as morals, et cetera. And my goal of, the goal of my work is to try and create space for people to listen more and talk a little bit less, to kind of create space for reflection and introspection. Last year, the nameless boy who gave his name to Sunday uh, won me the Exposure Festival's Emerging Photographer of the Year. And as such, I was awarded the opportunity to exhibit a larger body of work at this year's Exposure Festival. My newest and latest se series, which you're seeing now, 
is currently on view at Contemporary Calgary as a part of this year's Exposure Festival. And the exhibition is called The Parable of the Boy and the Barren Olive Tree. It's a super personal and deeply emotional look into my own past, the trauma lessons, scars, truths that I've brought with me from my time within the religious institution or a religious institution. Um, it's the first time I'm including sculptural elements with the photographs to continue the investigation of narrative within a conceptual, I, I have a hard time with this word, but multidisciplinary practice. It is structured as a three act play and the series investigates that derangement my body, mind, spirit have kind of endured over those years and how this history affects my present plot, my current platforms surrounding my own spirituality. Uh, it's a really brilliant opportunity and I'm really honored to be able to express such a personal and emotional journey with other incredible artists that are at the Exposure Festival this year. And that's my marathon. Thank you so much for attending this talk with myself and these two incredible artists. I'm just beyond excited. And um, thank you. I'm gonna pass us off back to Ashley and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks again. Thank you so much, um, all three of you. It's really great to be able to get a little bit more context and hear um, there's always so many stories behind every artwork that um, at first glance you don't always get to recognize those stories. Um, so this is why I love when artists get to talk about their work because you always get to hear, you know, more about uh, what drives the work. And so that's really great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, uh, before I jump into kind of our panel discussion where I've prepared some general questions uh, for each of you. I just want to also mention that um, all three of these artists as they were part of um, or are part of Trex exhibitions, they also have catalogs online um, that have more in-depth information about each of the um, series. They have their artist statements and bios and there's some educational elements to those catalogs. And I'm just gonna link them in the chat for everybody. Um, if this will work, there we go. Um, so you're welcome to check those out if you'd like to. Um, but yeah, with that, I'm just gonna jump into some more general questions. Obviously there's so many questions that I could jump into for you know each of your series, but tonight we're gonna focus a little bit about um, what does it mean to be an emerging photographer as all three of you uh, were selected as part of the Emerging Photographer Showcase at, as part of Exposure Festival. Um, and this is sort of uh, the a proverbial emerging uh, word in the arts world is really interesting to me because that can mean a lot of different things. Um, I'm curious what each of you, um, what, your, what your thoughts are on um, the word emerging and <laughs> how you define yourself as an artist. Do you still define yourself as an emerging artist? What does that look like for you? Anybody can jump in. Uh, Nahani? Yeah, I can jump in first. I think from doing all these Canada Council grants and still be taking the emerging um, box is kind of still like, I've been out of school for seven years. Like, how can I still be emerging? But they just want to make sure, I think when it's emerging, they just want to make sure that you know your stuff and working under mentorship is very important. And then the more you do, or you're, the more you're in shows, the more you get educated, the more you have mentors, um, the more, the smarter and more confident you are about your photography. Um, and for me, I'm still learning every day, even though I've been, I'm in a show almost every couple of months now. and you never stop learning. And I feel like even if I go to get out of the emerging category, um, I'll still like take note and go to classes and artist talks to learn more. Joel or Liam, do either of you want to jump on that one? I can jump in a uh, quick thing. I mean, emerging is one of those, to me, one of those words that just exists for someone to define something about yourself. I feel like I will be emerging until someone tells me otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so it's, to me, emerging is, 
is honestly one of the best places to be because it gives you this opportunity to really try something different. You can go really left field with something and, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to exist in, in a previous book or language that you've already established. It can, it gives you this opportunity to really explore something. And I don't know if I ever really want to lose that. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe I'll be emerging until I'm 60. And <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I think Nahani and Joel both nailed it. It's um, it's an interesting place to be, and I really don't know when I won't be an emerging artist, if ever. Yeah, there there's definitely a freedom to that. I agree, and yeah, being able to do, uh, yeah, like you said, go left field with projects, try new things. Um, and you're not, you don't become sort of pegged in as this very specific artist that uh, sometimes I think bigger artists can end up that way. Um, people that are really widely known, um, then it, yeah, that's, that's an interesting perspective. Um, I, I'm wondering if each of you could describe how long you've been working with the medium of photography and uh, why you like to use the medium of photography over other media, over other uh, forms. Um, I guess I'll start off. I've picked up a, my film, first film camera when I was just a teenager. So it's, we're coming on 16, 17 years since then, but it's been, much closer to five to seven years or so of having had an idea of what the hell I was doing with the camera um, and having a bit of intention with my with my work. So pretty different range there. Uh, and I think I like photography versus other mediums. Just, I, I like the, medium as a very accessible uh, visual art form. You know, you don't need, you don't necessarily need a studio. Um, as much as I love ceramics and wood, having access to the tools, having access to the space where that's, where that's feasible is not, has never been something that I've had access to until very recently. So photography has allowed me Something that I found to be very accessible. It's also very uh, portable. And so over the past 10 or 15 years, I have lived and traveled across most of Canada. And I'm not a very good writer. So photography has allowed me to do something and carry it with me in my, my bag from, for all of that. Um, I've been doing photography since high school. So this was my first camera I have on hand as a show and tell, I guess. And um, I was like, what is this? And now I use it. Now it's my main camera. But before it was like a point and shoot um, that I took photos of parties. And I was like, I'm a photographer. And then I went to Emily Carr and I got in actually for videography and I just took a class in photography and I fell in love with it. And yeah. And I think going to art school is a risk and going for to art school for something you're not into is even more of a risk. So I just like followed my heart and did it. I'm so happy. I did choose this path and it led me here, which I hope goes up from here or maybe after Venice, I'll just quit. I'll be like, I did it. I'm at the top, but yeah, that was my little thing. I can jump in quick. I saw, honey, I saw you reaching for your camera. So I did the same thing. So I have, this is my dad's camera. This is what taught me photography when I was in, oh my goodness, I would have been 14, 13, 14. And then recently I got my grandfather's camera and I experiment with both. Ironically, I use more digital than anything else, but I find I was always drawn to it, but when I was going through my art career and, and learning to be a sculptor or then 
a performance artist, I always used photography, same with woodworking. I used it to kind of bolster the practice and never necessarily as a main road. And so I think recently a lot like what Liam said is space is limited and you kind of have to make do with what you have. And so it became, it became this journey of just like, let's just pile all of this into a single sandwich and see what happens. Yeah, that's great. Um, I did notice there was a couple comments in the chat. Um, there is gonna be uh, a few more questions that I've prepared and then we're gonna jump into audience questions. Um, but there was a comment about what, uh, what does an artist call themselves after emerging artist? And Honey said, artist, <laughs> I like that. Um, but Gail Lint also works at the AFA with their collections and clarified some of the terms that they use um, is emerging, intermediate, senior and another category after beyond that would be historical so artists who have passed away um, that is the way of things with art collections so there you go um, I do have uh, one or two more questions here um, how have you noticed your use of the camera shift over the years with different um, photographic series like is there a way that you've used your photography or your, your camera specifically differently for different series. And like, maybe you could talk about um, how you came to those decisions with um, using your camera differently for different series. I can try to answer this. Um, so with Loop 14, I wanted an experimental, like in-depth feeling. And then with work um like money <laughs> more like it I use my DSLR because I need something quick easy um not gonna cost me a fortune um and then with my newest series I wanted to try something different I want and I I was fully prepared if the film didn't work out with my medium format um so it kind of depends what you're looking for and I don't know if I answered that question no totally And I think Nahani, you've you've talked before about um, some of some processes you've used for film where you've really experimented with like alternative chemicals or, or alternative natural materials to process the film, and it's created um, kind of ghosts in your images and things like that. So yeah, I developed my film with coffee once, and yeah. then in like an empty landscape, and then there was all these scratches, but I don't think there were scratches. I thought they were ghosts. Mm -hmm. um, I probably always just approached it from a very similar way, which is just from a documentary perspective. Um, I have a number of film cameras, but most of my um, work has been digital, just DSLR. It's been most of cost savings things for me. Um, however, since the start of the pandemic, I have been using media format for quite a lot of my own personal work, which may or may not ever see the light of day. But um, yeah, I've got a, a Hasselblad that I've been shooting a series of uh, mostly self-portraits with. But I never, um, I tried in high school to take a photography course where I would have been able to play in the dark room and try all of these things, but I never took an introduction course in grade nine. So they told me to take a hike. I, I, this is a hard question. I don't, it's a really hard question. I think that, I don't know if how I've used my camera has ever changed. I think that I actually have a very similar mind, like a point of view as Liam is, because I, I see myself more as a sculptor and performance artist that I see the photographs I present more as documentation of something mm -hmm. that, that has happened. But it's also this really interesting play of like capturing, taking something real like what you're taking a picture of and just like smushing it down into something unreal. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's this like really interesting material play of the photograph itself, like what it is. 
but then again, I go back into, in order for that to happen, I see it like it has to be printed and not all photography has to be printed. And then it's right. a whole other, like you're opening a can of worms. So it's, yeah. it, it's a, that's a hard question. Yeah. Maybe too in depth for the time that we have. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, I might um, open it up to the audience. So if there's questions from the audience, uh, we have one here. Um, what is the most meaningful thing you've learned about yourself through your practice? If anyone wants to answer that. I can jump in here if no one else wants to start. <laughs> um, uh, on the path of very difficult questions to summarize in a short period of time, I think the most meaningful thing I've learned about myself is I had it and I lost it. I think it's, it's along the realm of like, we're, we're okay. Everything's okay. It's not as it's, it's, it's okay. Like who you are and your history and what has happened exists and it's made you who you are. And so because of that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to dismiss any of that because I think that it's important. Um, and I also think it's, it's let me know that learning at all times is the best way to live. Like just constantly trying to push yourself, learn more, learn more about the medium or the material or what you're taking a picture of or how you're taking the picture or anything like that. Just like consistently actively learning at all times is the best way to just continue stepping forward. That's great. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, there's another question in the chat if Nahani and Liam um, don't wanna jump on that question. For those who enjoy photography and taking pictures but wouldn't call or consider, consider themselves a professional photographer or artist, how could this person take better, more meaningful photos in their life? I know, Mark, so I will let someone else answer because he could just ask me at work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think if you're not interested in calling yourself a professional photographer, pursuing the title of artist, and you're just interested in taking more, um, powerful photos, practice is number one. Um, and then if you know somebody who is as talented as Nahani, and you can <laughs> you can you can uh, sort of pick their brain and and talk to them. It's definitely a good start. Is getting feedback from people whose um, work you like and whose opinion you trust. It's probably where I would start. I have a question if that's okay yeah so I just want to say this is a brilliant event and thank you it's lovely to see you all um I guess I have one comment and one question um my comment is Nahani I love your new work <laughs> I love this you know way that you bring in so many different elements into your new work like archival documents you know embroidery the wall writing there I think it's all fantastic and it all sort of like encapsulates you know what you're trying to say I guess one question to, okay, I guess I've got, is that a comment or a question? I guess one, <laughs> I guess one question for Nahani is, where did, the, where did it change? Where did, what inspired you to bring in those elements into your, your practice? And then my second question is for all three of the artists here. And that is, what does your like sort of research pre-production look like for you? Like Liam, how do you, you know, plan your trips? Uh, Joel, how do you go about, you know, uh, you know, playing your sculptures and how that incorporate that into your photography, and uh, you know, Nahani, you've mentioned a few books there. Like, how do you how do you select, uh, you know, what research material you you choose to look at? 
So I guess lots of questions there and I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, so for, to answer the one about my new work, um, like everyone else on Turtle Island here, I was so upset by the unmarked graves. Um, so that was kind of like my reaching out to, I need to do something, but I want it to bring her closer to home and stuff. Like I know when people go on Instagram, they share whatever news there is like a very general where you're like, yes, that's important, but I wanted to hit home, um, and make people in the Bow Valley care and make people I love and like are close to me, um, care as well. So I chose to do it about the decolonization of the national park. Um, and using my new work, I, t- I harvested that mud. I don't, I'm not supposed to, but I feel like as an indigenous person, it's my right to go on my home land and, um, use these practices as my artwork. So that was kind of a protest. I want to say to the national park system. Um, I wanted to use beadwork because my grandmother was beaded. She, her husband was first nations. She wasn't. Um, but I taught, I learned from her and I wanted to use that traditional native practice in my work. And I'm very into mountaineering. I'm very into ski touring. I'm very into being into backcountry. It's not, it's not my, it's not my identity, but it is important to me, these aspects. And that's also like a colonial, um, thing is to ski like what a weird thing to do like put two sticks on your feet and go down a mountain like it's so odd and that and people didn't start naming mountains until um settlers came here and they're named after the whitest people I just there's a mount white like I don't understand and I that's my my wish is to decolonize the mountains and I want to take it past my artwork to make more of a conversation in it and my new work uh hole eight is I'm a big golfer. I freaking love golfing. Um, and, uh, but I hate the fact that the most expensive top 10 golf course in the world is in a wildlife corridor here, like down the street from me. Um, so my new work is the decolonization of land and the honoring of animals. Um, I'm Cree. My family's from Winnipeg moved over to Saskatchewan somehow I ended up in Banff. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is very much my home and it's not paradise as everyone who thinks it is and visits here. I'll shut up. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, Beth, I'm sorry. I was so engrossed with Nahani's answer. Could you repeat your question? Yeah, of course. So I was just wondering what the sort of like research, like pre-planning stages look, looks like for each of the artists. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, for myself, I tend to just become curious about a subject and then I pursue it until I hopefully have some sort of answer or at least until I feel like I've learned or satisfied my curiosity about about it. Um, So one project that I'm I'm currently working on that's on hold because of COVID is a camper, camper group. So people who travel from around Alberta or from further further afield to work in the camps up north um, became interested in that before before moving out to Alberta. And once here, trying to gain access was a bit of a challenge. So I reached out to um, nine to five, I work at the trades. So I reached out to colleagues at work who maybe had done camp work or who might know somebody. Um, From there, I reached out to places like Husky Energy um, to try to get access. And when all that's failed, I went to a temp agency and got a job doing mold remediation, uh, living in a camp. So I kind of just start throwing things at a wall and seeing what sticks. Um, but yeah, usually I've, I mean, I personally have no qualms about going to a company, 
Um, if, if it's an industrial, if it's somehow related to industry, I don't necessarily have any qualms about going to that industry and asking for access. Um, I found that for some of the things that I wanted to do, it's literally the only way to gain access is, is with their permission. Um, I mean, I recognize that might be, there's a certainly a balance that has to be struck between gaining their permission and allowing them to have any kind of influence or control um, over the final product, but that's usually what I do. Um, so to just to recap, because uh, you were curious about um, the kind of the birth of the sculptures and how it turns into something. Um, I, 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 it's a, it's a hard question to answer as well. Um, I'm a very intuitive maker, so I, I tend to just kind of start. Um, usually there is some sort of emotional guideline or signpost that I start with where I, this happened and it made me feel this and that feeling felt round or sharp or red or bulbous or shallow or you know kind of experimenting with adding physicality to emotional inputs and outputs and then from there I just kind of start um, and I, I go through this process of what I call failing things I think that it's the easiest way to learn is to just do something until you get it right and so you just try it if once it's finished you kind of have that conversation with the object you've created and and pull in that initial, pull, pull it back to that signpost and say, are you two talking to each other in every lane or is something missing? And if what's, what's missing or what's working and then taking what's working, putting that to the side and throw it at something new, as Liam said, throw it at something to see what sticks. And eventually it creates, um, usually once I have one really good successful object, that is especially recently that aligns to how I feel my body should position with that object. It kind of creates this breadcrumb trail of everything that needs to come with it. And so that's kind of how I start is, is I, I begin experientially and then I kind of move into instinctually and then I move into analytically until it's something. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we're right at seven. So I just want to kind of wrap things up and thank you all for coming. Um, it's been such a pleasure to hear about your series. Um, and thank you for enlightening us all about your practice, what you're up to. Um, please check out each of these artists on um, Instagram on their different social media. So you can follow along what they're up to next. And um, maybe they'll put their um, tags into the chat if they want to. But yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you Exposure and Alberta Foundation for the Arts. And um, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their evening. <laughs>